Chapter 2. Coolness. Hart swallowed a yawn. <sighs> but it was a tired yawn, not a bored yawn. He liked assemblies. Sometimes the programs were good. And even if they weren't, an assembly was still pretty much free time. As long as you kept looking straight ahead and didn't shut your eyes, you could think about anything you wanted to for almost an hour, which didn't happen very often at school. Up on stage, two men and two women were dressed in costumes from the 1840s. The guy in the straw hat had a banjo, and the woman wearing blue jean overalls had a guitar. All four were singing some songs about the Erie Canal. They were good musicians, and the way they used folk songs to show American history was pretty interesting. But they'd been at it for almost 35 minutes, and it was starting to get old. Hart tuned them out. Another yawn. Hart let his mind drift back a few hours, and he remembered the sound of the noisy water pipes in the wall next to his bed, which was why he'd been awake since 6 a.m. today. That was when his dad had started taking a shower. Hart had tried to get back to sleep, but the automatic coffee maker had already filled the house with the smell of morning. Usually his mom had to pull Hart out of bed at the last second so he could throw on some clothes, drag a comb through his hair, grab a piece of toast, a swallow of juice, and then sprint to catch the school bus. And as he hurried through the kitchen, Sarah always said something like, It's so stupid to be late. Not today. Hart was starting a second bowl of cereal when his parents had come into the kitchen a little before seven. His mom had been surprised. Are you feeling all right, Hardy? And Hart had said, I'm fine, Mom. I just woke up early, that's all. And please stop calling me Hardy, okay? Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. Up on stage, the two men came out wearing a mule costume and began towing a barge around. Hart smiled, but he kept thinking about the morning. It had only taken his dad about three minutes to get ready, scanning the front page of the morning paper while he poured coffee into his travel mug. Then Mom had handed him a toasted bagel wrapped in a napkin, got a kiss in return, and Dad was all set to go. That's when Hart had popped the question. Dad, can you drive me to school today? Sorry, Hart, I've got to beat the traffic, and if I drove you now, you'd be there almost an hour early. After the front door closed, Hart had listened for the rumble as his dad started the new sports car. He'd only had it about three weeks. Low bridge, everybody down. The performers were trying to get the sixth graders to sing along on the chorus of the song. It wasn't working. Hart thought, no wonder dad gets up early and drives to the city every morning. With a car that sweet, who wouldn't? Hart couldn't wait to get dropped off at school in that car. He could see it. His dad would turn into the wide front circle, whip past the parked buses, and come to a crisp stop at the front walk. The door of the silver roadster would swing open, and as all the kids turned to stare, Hart would step out. He'd slam the door, wave to his dad, and then the little bullet car would blaze off down Highway 12. That hadn't happened, not yet. But it wasn't like Hart actually needed any help in the coolness department. Hart Evans was well on his way to becoming the most popular boy at Palmer Intermediate, just like he had been for the last two years at Collins Elementary School. It had never been a contest. Plenty of guys at school were more handsome, a lot of guys were tougher, and some were smarter, too. Didn't matter. Hart was still the coolest. Even his name was cool. Hart, which was short for Hartford, also a cool name. Zach Banks and Alex Neely were Hart's two best friends at Palmer Intermediate. Alex was a little taller than Hart, but not at all athletic. He loved to read, and he had a quick mind and a sharp sense of humor. He lived near Hart, and they'd gone to Collins Elementary together. Hart called Alex whenever he had a computer issue, or whenever he didn't understand an assignment, or any time he needed a good laugh. And they still sat together on the bus every morning, just as they had all through grade school. One of their strongest common interests was in the junk collecting department. The trash pickup in Brentbury was early Wednesday morning, and when the weather was right, Hart and Alex rode their bikes around for a Tuesday night treasure hunt. Alex understood that Hart was popular, but he wasn't impressed, except by the way girls talked to Hart. Right before the Halloween dance, Alex had said, I give you permission to put in a good word about me to Regina, or maybe Emily, or Caroline, or Sue, or any girl, please. Zach was a different story. Zach had dark curly hair and a big smile, and he was the best soccer player in Brentbury's Junior League. 
He was plenty popular on his own, but during the first week of sixth grade, Zach had looked around and decided that being friends with Hart would be a smart move. They were in the same homeroom, so it had been pretty easy. You and me, Hart, Zach said one day with a wink. We got it made. And there was some truth to that, and Hart knew it. The difference was that Hart didn't work at being popular. It just came naturally. Just this morning, milling around in the crowd outside the auditorium, at least a dozen different kids had smiled or waved at Hart, trying to catch his eye, hoping for something in return. Because if Hart noticed you, it made you feel good. And Hart was generous. He nodded at Lee and smiled at Steve, and he said, Hey, Tommy. And then came a nod to a guy on the other side of the hall, and then, Dan, how's it going? Great shoes. Those new? And it wasn't a fakey nice. Hart was for real. No one was immune to Hart's good nature, his easy self-confidence. When he apologized as he turned in his first social studies report a day late, Miss Mowdy had said, I'm still going to have to lower your grade, Hart. But she didn't. When Hart got caught swinging on the rope in the gym, Mr. Harvest shouted, Evans, that'll be ten laps after school. Then when a smiling Hart Evans showed up at three o'clock sharp, the gym teacher growled, Go on, catch your bus, but don't let it happen again. Hart could have charmed the hairnet off a cafeteria lady. It was almost Thanksgiving, but to Hart, it felt like the school year was practically over. The days flipped by, and sixth grade at Palmer Intermediate was turning out to be a breeze. His friends were good, his classes were only a minor disruption in his busy social life, and the homework wasn't too bad either. In short, school was great. Hart felt like he owned the place. Except, that is, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, right after lunch. Because that was when it was time for chorus. And for Mr. Minert. Hart actually loved music. He had taken two years of piano lessons, and recently he'd also begun to play a band instrument. The coolest one, of course, the drums. Except the sixth grade band already had three other more experienced drummers, and that was why Hart had been put into the chorus. He even had a decent singing voice. At least, it sounded good to him when he sang in the shower. So music itself wasn't the problem. Hart just didn't like chorus. He didn't like standing up and opening his mouth wide and singing songs that he never would have chosen to sing on his own. Hart liked his music and his songs, and he liked to sing them his way, not Mr. Minert's way. And then there were the concerts. They were the worst part of the whole deal. The school year seemed like an endless flow of programs and performances. First, it was the Halloween spooker, and then came the holiday concert, and then the midwinter sing-along, then the spring has sprung program, and finally, finally, the graduation celebration. Concerts meant learning new songs, and that meant singing them over and over again. And then there was the whole rigmarole of standing up and sitting down together, and walking on and off the stage and not fidgeting on the risers and holding the little folder of sheet music and wearing the white shirt and the black pants and the black socks and the black shoes. <sighs> Hart was sure that Mr. Minor had designed the entire chorus experience so it would be as awkward and annoying and uncomfortable as humanly possible. Chorus simply was not cool, not one bit of it, which meant that chorus cramped Hart's style in the worst possible way. Because at one end of the Palmer School universe, there was Hart and his slowly rotating galaxy of ultimate coolness. Then, way, way down at the other end of time and space, past all the stars and moons and planets, there was Mr. Minert, singing his head off somewhere inside a very uncool black hole. Since it was almost Thanksgiving, Mr. Minert was already doing the big push to get ready for the holiday concert, and it was a push. A one-hour musical extravaganza required a massive effort, and from Mr. Minert's point of view, his chorus was the main event of the whole show. For over a week, Mr. Minert hadn't even tried to tell any jokes. He'd been stiff and grumpy and more demanding than ever. Just to pass the time away. The last song of the morning assembly was I've Been Working on the Railroad, and the performers asked all the kids to stand up and sing along. The banjo player kept stopping the song to shout, can't you kids sing louder than that? By the third time he'd done it, they were all screaming the words at the tops of their lungs, and when the song ended, the applause was so loud and went on so long that Mr. Richards, the principal, had to get up on the stage and make everyone be quiet. As the kids began leaving the auditorium, 
Hart caught a glimpse of Mr. Minert at the side of the stage, thanking the performers. Hart smiled, and he thought, See you after lunch, Mr. Minert. Today, for the first time all year, Hart was pretty sure that chorus was going to be fun.